I enjoy photographing people that give me a reason to lift my camera. I think it's very different and very difficult when there's very little visual interest. I tend not to spend a lot of time with the sitter beforehand and I let them, through my assistants or PA, decide if they want hair or makeup or, or you know what's at their disposal depending what it is. I usually stay away at that point and when I meet them it's when they sit down or stand up in front of the camera and I let it go from there. I try and let things um, orchestrate themselves in a way. I've always chosen some lighting that I think is appropriate or the way that I want to see that person um, but I'm often wrong. I'm often I often start shooting and realize quite quickly I shoot a few frames and then I go look at the screen which is always turned away from the from the sitter. Sometimes I include, especially if people are actors, um, because they can bring a lot. They're equal to me in the collaboration then I feel. But with people that I that are nervous, I certainly turn the screen away. I have a different area of the studio that I go to to have a look. And um, very often I decide that what I thought was so would be appropriate really isn't and I rethink it. And that's what um, that's when it gets interesting really, when you start changing it and reacting to who a person is or how they are and how you can show it. It's very, un it's very, it's not a real cerebral thing for me and therefore very difficult to put into words. And in a way I, I'm quite scared of really actually finding out how I work because I'm not sure if it'll be as um, um, edgy anymore. But I do use light to reveal, or the opposite of reveal, with my subjects, how they are feeling or how I feel. And I think that there's a lot of, of correspondence and communication between two human beings that goes on without one's mouth moving. And that's in body language and I think just in brain waves. I think we do really connect. And it's quite a... It's often quite a heightened moment for the sitter because you know they have a they have somebody quite near them with a camera pointing at them and it's uh, and I think in those heightened moments you communicate even better and I think something like that goes on and I really trust him you know that's what I trust and I think that's the moment that a picture becomes a portrait I really deal with a cadaver of a person it's a form in front of me that I show in a certain way by lighting in a certain way I'm certainly not looking for a truth in them. Often I think it might be more a truth in me. I might move a light because I want to reveal something more about a person or, or, or make it feel a bit more sinister by, by moving a light back. And that's really how I work. I'm not trying to talk to them and as they, you know, as they um, move a hand, catch something, or as they rub their head. I think that when I've done that in the past, it's been... It's been because there was nothing else, you know. It's it's the last resort, really. I far prefer to settle people and um, try to get more of a rich emotion. I like to know how they look, um, so I recognise who's who when they walk in the door. But really, not much more than that. I really like the connection that human beings have um, when there isn't a great knowledge. Um, like when you first meet people. I would find it very, very hard to photograph a friend well or to photograph somebody that I knew well. I think that that tension when you first meet people allows you to communicate without speaking really sharply. So no, I don't find out a lot. I don't chat a lot. I hardly talk when I photograph. But I do... I, there'll be something about a person that will... will cause me to direct them following things they do. They might glance somewhere and it makes me think something that I trust and try something with them. And slowly they become themselves, a very accurate themselves. And that's when I think it works the best. When I first received the commission, it was... Um, I was obviously really, really proud to work once again with the National Portrait Gallery. It really means a lot having grown up in South Africa and now being here 30 years, I've always, you know, it feels like my national gallery and I'm really proud. Um, 
And, you know, I immediately realized these might be people, the rising stars part of the commission, uh, might be people that uh, are incredibly famous for their sport in years to come. Um, so, you know, there's quite a lot of responsibility to, to do something that, um, that matters. First of all, I thought of them being black and white, and I'm not sure why. I often work in this way where I just let things come into my consciousness and I feel them out and think about them and um, uh, um, see, how they, see how they fit. And black and white seem to, to have an iconic status for me, especially when it comes to sport, probably because of the uh, influence of Lenny Riefenstahl in my life when I was 18 or so. I think I discovered her work and the film she did of the um, Olympics, the 36 Olympics. Uh, so that was probably the reason. But equally, I didn't want to do work like that that instantly would look very dated, very uh, iconic in that um, proletarian or German way. Um, um, I wanted to do something that was modern but still rooted, really rooted in photography. So black and white came up. The way that I, I, you know, I looked through a lot of the portraits that I've done before, looking for a fit for what might work for four different people um, and came up with this way of lighting that's really quite contrasty, uh, um, slightly revealing but not, not really. Most of the picture is in shadow. I always think you can tell so much more about your, yourself and why you react to a picture in the same way as people, for a good example would be how people react to Francis Bacon. There's very little information on the canvas yet you have a strong reaction. Or Rothko, maybe even that's better. There's almost nothing on the canvas. A lot of paint, but very little information, and yet you react in such a strong way, or some people do. So it's that kind of, um, it's taken me a while to work that out, but it's that kind of shrouding and a, a way of showing shadow is very compelling to me. I always think about the viewer even more than I do about the sitter. I think it's, I think when you're working in this domain, it's all about the visitors reacting to a photograph. So it becomes a triangle. You have your sitter, you have your photographer or artist, and you have the viewer. And that viewer is really, really important. And I think with the National Portrait Gallery, unlike, let's say, White Cube or Gagosian or the Met or the Tate, you are possibly not going to see art. You are going to, to receive information. The pictures need to be really accessible to a wide audience and I think lit the way they are, with, with you know, quite beautifully photographed, um, seemed to make a lot of sense to me. I think at about um, 11 years old or 12 years old, I started taking pictures and found that I was quite good at them, and I think it was probably the only thing that I felt good about. Schooling was a total failure for me. Um, I found it very difficult, more than a failure. Um, I think I always wanted to excel at something and loved the mechanics of cameras and, and taking pictures and the results that I seemed um, to get. So that's how I got into it. And by 13, I had my own camera. And then I went off. I went into motorbikes for quite a while. Then I had a really bad accident. And by 18, I was positive I was going to be, you know, that that's what my life would be. You know, growing up in South Africa, there wasn't TV until I was about 15. Uh, there certainly wasn't internet. Um, so I had a, f a few books, and in a way I think it was a really great way to, to be introduced because what you saw you really delved into. Now there's so much that I'm not sure what people take out of it or how they get influenced, but I was very, very influenced by Edward Weston. Um, and I think in many ways people know my work now as being so varied although it has a very strong strand of me in it and there's always a slightly uncomfortable feeling in my work a, a, a way that I just don't want to airbrush one's dark side away let's say um, is very much in Edward Weston's work too you know he would photograph a rusty car on the same day as a nude and a week later a cloud and when you look at them in a book that cloud and that nude are exactly the same, and the rusty car is not that different either. And I loved that, and I ought to, you know, I didn't see it as all oh, these are three different things. I just saw this as photography, um, and ex and a, and such a tight expression of who he was. 
and I've always followed that path. I've printed every single picture that I ever took, almost without exception, every single black and white and color picture that I've ever taken. And when the computer slowly came into my life, and at first I would come from the darkroom with a print and I would scan that in and then make a small adjustment, then soon after that I would be scanning the neg in but still doing a great print that I would then make my neg look like my print. And then after that I would stop, just print one to see what I wanted, still have the darkroom experience but come into the computer and finish it, do most of my work from scanning from the neg until eventually I wasn't walking into the darkroom and that probably took a year and a half what I've just described. And how I work on a computer now is very, very similar to how I worked in the darkroom where I, where I, you know, I try a certain color range and see how I respond to it and what I want to do to it. And I make changes and changes like I used to make print after print. And then I compare them all and see the direction I want to go. And really the only difference for me is that you can be far more accurate on a computer. You can really be more accurate if you want to, which I often choose not to be. I often choose to change whole areas rather than accurate areas. So I really see it as quite um, smooth and very important and very similar. Um, and the outputting, of course, is, is excellent now. If you, um, as I most of the time do with color work, uh, do lambda prints, it is photographic material, it's still a wet process. There are no spots. You know, the main th problem with all my old work is that wherever you spot it on color goes red after 10 years. So it's a, you know, it's a far, I think it's, really a far better way. Black and white possibly different. I think that there were so many mistakes and things that you might do in black and white that would add layering to a print that are not possible when you have to decide what to do always, which is the difference with the computer. I think what is different though with digital work is the taking. To photograph digitally than photographing on film I think is um, is much more of a question because with film you tend to uh, stay nervous longer and never be sure what you have and maybe try things that you would never try with the comparison of digital where as soon as you start to see on the screen that things are really working or that you have a fantastic shot you cannot keep that edge anymore your nervousness leaves you and once it's left you I don't think I've ever produced as well as that picture that when that l nervousness did leave me. Um, you go round in circles, but it's never the same. So I think there's real arguments for, if you do shoot digitally, to you know throw that screen out the window and just try and make it like film. The joy that I had originally with cameras and those beautifully made things that you would turn and click has really all gone. I have no love for the actual thing that I hold anymore when I do portraiture, which I certainly used to with the Hasselblad or my Linhoffs. I would have been happy if it had, you know, was still the way it was. I was very competent in the darkroom and I don't mind, I'm just using what's around.